Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Aaron just said, we're honored to have Tanner Krauss this um, afternoon or evening. Uh, Tanner is an alum. He's uh, graduated about five years ago, am I right? Uh, and um, he is currently the CEO of Come and Go, which is one of the largest um, convenience store chains in, uh, in the country, actually. Uh, he, they employ 5,000 people. There's 400 stores in 11 states. So we're talking um, serious numbers here. And uh, he's also held multiple roles in his company. He's going to tell us a little bit about that. Um, something that I remember about Tanner when he was a student is that when he came and talked to me, he actually knew two of the most direct routes to get my attention, which were wine and soccer. And uh, so, and which happened to be two of his passions as well, uh, that those may make an appearance during the talk um, as well. Um, when I discussed this talk with Tanner, actually, um, this, uh, we were just talking about this uh, before you guys arrived. Um, this is, I think, the only time I've discussed a, a talk with a guest in which there was no title. So there's actually no, no title for the talk. So and I told him, you know, if the word strategy makes a couple of appearances, you know, uh, that will make me happy. And the rest of the audience happy as well. And um, so I think uh, Tanner is just going to, to um, show us some of his freestyling abilities also during the talk. Um, without further ado, here's uh, Tanner Cross. Thank you for being here. Rafael, thank you so much. Good evening to everybody out there. I'm um, questioning all of you why you're here with me on a Friday night, but thank you. Um, I'll try to keep you entertained. Um, you know, as Aaron said, like, please, I know we have a Q&A at the end, but like feel very comfortable just like chatting the question or raising your hand as I'm talking because like 60 minutes of anybody can be a lot and I'm not exactly Chris Rock on a microphone. So like I'll do my best to keep you all entertained and keep things moving, but if this is interactive, it'll just flow a little better, I think, and we'll probably get more out of it. As well as like the more questions you ask, the more I can direct what I say to the interest of this group. You know, I've got a general understanding and feel for what might be of interest and topics of, you know, why I think Raphael invited me to do this. But again, it's your chance to kind of direct and really like I'm pretty comfortable answering almost every single question that we you could possibly think of. So like, don't be shy if something's crossing your mind. I'm kind of happy to go there. Um, as Raphael said, I'm, I'm an alum of DePaul and, um, you know, I just, I really got a lot out of my experience. You know, I'm, I'm an MBA student, um, or I was, I guess, and, uh, DePaul like was, yeah, I'd never really taken my schooling as seriously as I did when I got to DePaul. Like I, you know, just growing up as a kid, whatever had maybe other priorities and I kind of got through school and, uh, my undergrad experience actually is at Loyola. So don't hold that against me. I'm uh, both a Loyola alum and a DePaul alum. Um, I chose Loyola, I had the opportunity to, to go play soccer for the Ramblers. And so uh, I was able to, to go Loyola. I'm a Des Moines uh, kid, still I live back here in Des Moines now. And I'm a big Iowa Hawkeyes fan. I always thought, you know, my dream in life would be to go to the University of Iowa, come back and work for Come and Go. That's what my grandpa did, that's what my dad did, that's what I was gonna do, but then Loyola came calling and, and I'm really happy that I chose Loyola and that really changed my life and for the better, uh, particularly like in just like my personal life. Uh, I'm married with a two year old girl and I met my wife at Loyola. I also got the experience to uh, play soccer at a high level and live in Italy and do some other things that Loyola just really allowed me to do, which was fantastic. And I got back into um, the come and go business after a three year stint with the Gallo winery. Um, come and go is a family business. And we also have a policy of which you won't get hired by the family unless you have at least three years of outside experience. So the idea is you don't just kind of float through university and then have a job ready for you. So uh, that wasn't really a problem for me. You know, I, at that stage of my life, you know, 22, just started dating my girlfriend, who's now my wife. I wasn't ready to move back to Des Moines and to leave Chicago and all those things. So I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to work for Gallo. Uh, what a great program that I was in with them and, and really just a lot of development and uh, an organization with similar values to come and go. The Gallo Winery is a multi-generation family business with strong value system and focus on people. I like to think come and go is one of those as well. Um, 
so I did my three years and honestly was going to run further with Gallo. I was out in New York City leading a sales team. Um, those stories are much more amusing, but I'll try to stay on points. But working in the New York City liquor business is, uh, I've got a big cast of characters out there. Uh, but I came back to Des Moines and started working for Come and Go in 2013 uh, because that was the year that my grandfather uh, actually ended up passing away from cancer. Uh, my grandfather founded the company and you know, I had known from a very young age that I wanted to do this job I have today, which I love saying. Um, I thought I would run out the Gallo dream a little bit longer, but you know, even though I think my grandpa knew, my grandma knew, my family knew that I'd come home at some point, I wanted there to be more concrete than that. And so just to be able to kind of overlap with my grandpa's last couple of days on earth and, and me to be able to like make it real was really important to me. So I came back into the business at Come and Go and got reacquainted with our stores. I was a district supervisor, had a network of stores in Des Moines that I was supervising. And I, I recognized that if I was going to uh, be as successful as I could be within this company, that I would benefit from higher education. Um, you know, I, I got a lot of Loyola and I don't want to, you know, um, be too deprecating. You know, I had a, whatever, like a three, five, and I had, you know, double major and was, you know, doing hard classes towards the end of my career. But as I like to say, like I learned pretty quickly, you could skip class, but you couldn't skip practice. And, you know, as a, you know, 20 year old, something's got to give. And so I, you know, uh, uh, did my thing and, and got through it and had a good experience, but, you know, to, to run an organization that, you know, does more than 2 billion in revenue and, you know, uh, is responsible for the payroll and lives of 5,000 people, you know, uh, you want to just be as fully prepared for that responsibility as possible. So I was able to get back to Chicago and, uh, DePaul was great for me and, uh, it really changed the course of my life and this time in a professional sense. You know, I came in uh, with a finance concentration in mind as you know, I kind of had an undergrad in finance and my dad is just a financial genius. And so that was really kind of the exposure I had. But uh, while I was there, I had uh, a bit of a roundabout path to where I ended up and, and I do have a strategy concentration. And, and um, there's really, there were, there were two, there were two teachers and, and kind of us two, two fields of study that I discovered in my a grad program that I really didn't anticipate going in. And one is strategy and one is management. You know, I didn't take really any strategy classes in my undergrad work. And I just took the kind of basic management coursework. Um, but when I got into my first program or my first trimester, I had Professor Rubin teaching 501, just kind of the core uh, management course. And, um, you know, I, Professor Rubin changed, you know, changed my life for the better. He's one of those professors that I really just uh, responded to the way that he taught, you know, him being a researcher and me being a, someone that takes a lot of evidence to, to change my opinion or become convinced of things, you know, it was a good match. And just understanding that there actually are statistically proven ways and best practices to, to lead people, to manage people and design, to, to design organizations was something that I was really kind of uh, encountering for the first time. You know, like there's just these really um, dated myths out there around the best way to interview or the best way to give feedback or the best way to, you know, pay people or reward people. And, you know, when you're presented with two decades of evidence in a meta-analysis across 200,000 participants that this is what predicts success, you, you, ha you can't look the other way and all of a sudden it's okay, here it is finally in a way that it can be proven. And, and then being in the retail business, you know, come and go, right? I mean, our products are not super proprietary. Like we don't own any patents. Like our IP is very limited. It's, it's, it's the value add in our business, but the magic in our business comes down to the execution and the, the delivery of customer service. And so, uh, so much of the, the value in, in our retail environment is, is, you know, in the hands of our frontline associates. You know, these are the associates that are furthest from the boardroom, furthest from um, company strategy, company meetings, and also, you know, the lowest paid people in the entire organization. And so uh, every CEO will tell you, oh, people are the most important thing in our business and all that and all that. But 
Yeah, that's probably true. But at the end of the day, you know, like if Gucci designs really ugly purses, like I don't care how good their, you know, sales staff is going to be like, they're not, people aren't going to buy their purses or maybe they will because they're Gucci, but they're not going to have the same kind of success. Right. And so for us, like we don't have the opportunity to continue to innovate on product design or um, some algorithm that gives us an advantage. It comes down to our people. So long way of saying, I really saw an opportunity to take what I had learned uh, between Ruben and Deerdorf and the management program at Kelstat and come back to come and go. And, you know, something I never thought I would say to my dad as we were talking succession was, I really want the opportunity to run HR one day. And, you know, as an ops guy growing up, it was, you know, like HR was slowing me down, right? It was like, well, what do you mean I can't fire this person? Like they're terrible at their job. Well, she's pregnant. So you got to go through these steps and it's like, okay, but she's terrible at her job. And so, you know, that was kind of a relationship as just a young, naive ops person. And now, you know, as a, you know, woke MBA student, I was like, all right, no, actually this can be a value creation center for our business and we can do a better job of treating it as such. And then additionally, when I got exposure to just the economics team at Kelstad and then ultimately the strategy team, I realized that it was through that type of coursework where I would learn how to think and learn how to uh, decipher problems and to see to see what's coming. And you know, we spent a lot of time studying major inflection points in companies' history, and we studied the decisions of leadership, and we studied uh, companies that failed and companies that succeeded, and so. I knew that that was a field of study that would prepare me to run an organization one day. And so I really enjoyed the work I got. Uh, I see Professor Thompson on the call and his classes and certainly Raphael and his classes. And um, I came back to Des Moines and, and would not have had near the success that I have had in come and go land without the experiences that I got at DePaul and the people that I met along the way. So. It's a very long way of saying thank you to DePaul and I'm happy to give back uh, my time. And I'm sure at some point Raphael asked me for a donation too, but I'm happy to give back my time at least now um, in order to just you know, repay the, the, the value that I got from uh, this, this, this great program. It really over delivered for me. So um, tonight I'll tell you a little bit more about me, um, but I'll tell you more about our business and you know, Come and Go is really just one of our 10 operating companies. So I'll tell you a little bit more about um, our family enterprise and what we've all got and what we're working on. And then I do want to dive in a little bit deeper to some of the uh, disruption that's happening in our industry and talk about some of the strategy that we're creating in order to respond and succeed as a result of what we're seeing. So. Uh, without further ado, like again, please feel free to uh, steer me and ask questions via chat or raising your hand. Um, as Raphael stated, we're a little north of 400 stores, uh, about 5,000 associates, and yeah, that puts us at a top 20 chain in the industry. And uh, if you look at privately held uh, businesses like ours, we're a top five privately owned uh, C store fuel retail company in the country. So. A uh, good size to what we do, and I'm really drawn to the impact that an organization like Come and Go can have at this scale. And we have uh, a purpose in what we do, and we say that we're here to make days better by connecting with people. And what I love about retail is the connections. Like I grew up working in our stores. I started working in our stores when I was nine years old. I love it. Like when I go on store visits across the country to see Come and Goes. I've got my pin, I jump behind the counter and I'll check people out. Like if I'm in Arkansas or Colorado or Missouri or wherever we are, like I love that part of retail. And when I think about our scale and when I think about we have 500,000 transactions a day over the counter. And then you think about if you can actually live our purpose consistently and you can, you can deliver 500,000 little points of delight all of a sudden you start, you start stacking that, right? And okay, 
Uh, it doesn't take a DePaul MBA to know that it's a million people every two days. And then you're talking millions a week and you're talking virtually the equivalent of the population of America over the course of a year. And if you think about, you know, could we in the pretense of just selling uh, a cup of coffee or a six pack of beer, uh, make somebody's day better and, and provide a little bit of joy and delight and happiness into this world. And then you stack that 500,000 times a day. You know, we really had an opportunity to come and go to do something special. And, and in these just kind of routinized and mundane transactions that we have, but to really deliver happiness, uh, not to quote Tony Shea, but just to really have those special moments. You know, I love that about come and go. And so uh, this is a job I always wanted and I never thought I would be here this soon. Um, you know, we, I see a question in the chat. We're not franchise, uh, we're entirely family owned. Um, everything that we have is, uh, you know, a family thing. So um, I can talk about our new store growth here in a little bit, uh, but please keep the questions coming. Thanks, Joseph. Um, so, you know, came back in the business, had the opportunity to run HR for us. Um, my biggest accomplishment and thing I'm most proud of in my entire career to date is we, we completely reworked our human capital management system. The way that we design and operate our stores got completely overhauled. We had a, a model that really, the way that we designed and set up the people component of our stores that was really designed in the 90s. And as our business and our business model and our business strategy evolved, we never took the time to evolve our HR strategy and our people strategy at the store level. And so we had a situation back in 2015 2016, really when I got back into the business, uh, where our turnover was lagging the industry average. And we had a limited number of full-time people and we had poor internal promotion. And we just really had kind of overgrown the model that we were operating in. And so we needed something different, something to better serve us. So uh, we converted uh, about 2000 people from far, from part-time to full-time. And now we're about 75% of our staff is a full-time uh, employee of the business. And we created uh, specific roles with set schedules. And so I don't know how many of y'all worked in uh, service or retail, um, but if you did, you understand how like your schedule comes out like three or maybe 10 days in advance. And then that's when you find out like what your life is and what your income is going to be for those two weeks. And that's just a really uh, disrespectful way to treat people, quite frankly, right? Like how do you ever like have some sort of actual life when you don't know those things three days in advance, right? So we created set schedules so that all these full-time employees now work the same five shift pattern every single week of the year, we pay weekly. So now they can bank on that check being at a minimum of what it is every week. So we've now been able to have people go out and uh, prove to the bank that they have consistent income and get a car loan so they can get their own mode of transportation. We've got people that now have confidence to sign a 12 month lease because they know what their income is going to be for the next 12 months virtually guaranteed. And now they're able to get their own apartment for the first time or get out of a bad relationship or a situation living wise or get out of their car, unfortunately, sometimes. And so uh, we've now got healthcare and 401k. We have paid maternity leave and paternity leave at retail frontline. We've done a lot of great things in terms of redesigning the way that uh, we have, uh, that we really manage our people. And, you know, if I go back to, to statistically, is it working? Like I said, we were lagging industry average on turnover by about 30% in 2015. Today, we're 30% better than the industry average on turnover. And so we're seeing a much higher rate of retention. We're seeing much better internal promotion to our GM position and our GM's lives are easier. And so we're having uh, historic lows in the company for associate turnover and uh, historic highs for GM retention, as well as uh, all time highs for associate engagement. So we're really starting to unlock a lot more um, productivity and happiness uh, in our associates through that. So that really has been um, a big part of what I've tried to accomplish. And, and I wanna give Professor Rubin, Deerdorf, and a lot of my DePaul 
uh, professor's credit for it allowing me to have the the information and the evidence to go make transformative change. And then of course my team into internally who was able to get it all done. Um, so I see a, a question in the chat. Um, my undergraduate focus, I double majored in finance and economics um, and then minimum wage. So we've never really been a minimum wage empl employer and I, I don't think anybody even actually pays a minimum wage. I don't know how you can attract a single person at 7.25 an hour. I mean, that just, the labor market just doesn't even support that today. So, you know, in Des Moines, we're starting um, right now at about 12.50 in, in town. Um, we've historically been at what we call like the 50th percentile in terms of the pay scale. And we've, we've just tried to stay competitive on wages, not be a leader, not be a laggard and win on culture and win on values and that's been good for us but at the same time we're also now recognized not even recognizing we just have a more of a passion and interest in uh improving our competitive position when it comes to pay and so we've got a plan over the next six years to elevate come and go from a 50th percentile payer to a 75th percentile payer now it's a little bit kind of science and how you kind of measure that right like do you count the Amazon distribution center? Do you count Starbucks? Do you count the mom and pop? But generally speaking, we're going to be making outsized increases in wages for our store associates over the next five to six years to really try to separate. So if the industry is growing three, four percent a year, cost of living and merit, we're going to be trying to invest in seven or eight percent a year for the next five or six years, which is super, super expensive. Um, it doesn't exactly pencil out to the hardest ROI, but at the end of the day, it's about uh, just treating our associates with the dignity and respect that they deserve. And, you know, if you're going to work 40 hours a week for my company, I want you to be able to afford the necessities of life. And uh, unfortunately, we have a couple of situations today where uh, 40 hours, we don't quite pay a living wage. We do track MIT's living wage calculator and try to use that as some level of proxy for where we should set wages. And um, in 2019, we were two thirds of people hit the MIT goal. And in 2020, we were like 85% or closer to that. So, we're, you know, we're, we're accelerating wage rate. We're trying to get that going. Um, but uh, it's expensive and it takes time just to build that into your business. Um, Aaron, you had your hand up. Did you get your question answered? Did you want to ask anything? Yeah, actually, so I'll, you're kind of tuck, uh, hitting on this, but the benefits of treating your frontline workers and just workers in general with this, uh, with schedule and pay is, are you seeing that translate into more efficient operations as that op guy or like better consumer satisfaction or how is that translating uh, in, uh, into additional value for the business beyond just the value creation for your workers and your customers? Yeah, so when we set out to... Um, just upscale our pay, we couldn't find a single uh, hard piece of evidence, uh, professor or other company who could show us a way to pencil out a ROI on what we were doing. Uh, it's just too expensive to take wages as a line up 7% on a six year Kager and find that amount of incremental margin as a result or cost savings. We could, okay, turnover will go down, hard cost attached to turnover will go down and, you know, okay, we'll probably get a little better at in stock and suggest sell, but your comp line, at least for our, our business is so labor intense. Our comp line is just too big that when you have that kind of growth rate, you just really can't cover it in your p and elsewhere. So it really is a leap of faith on our end. Um, but in terms of what we are seeing, um, you know, we have had labor productivity um, beat our forecast consistently. And so uh, we're seeing you know, how much of that is because of what we're doing. It's really hard to say. It's hard to tease that part out. But at the very least, um, our productivity metrics are uh, exceeding every year's forecast since the last you know, three or four years. So those things are working. Those things are nice. Um, our mystery shop scores, our kind of, you know, kind of internal third-party audits are uh, improving consistently. So you know, we're seeing things uh, and continue to improve, but um, there's no exact formula to say, okay, this line will cover this much. And oh yeah, we'll get a, this, we'll get a four-year payback on these wage rate increases. It's just more of uh, doing the right thing and, and having a little bit of faith in, in what we're doing. 
Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And like the squishiness of that is there's, I mean, it's hard to track, but it's not like showing someone respect and like the dignity goes a long way. And that I've, the productivity scores is probably is an interesting reaction, but uh, it's nice to hear someone talking about this from a, we can't track it, but we know there's having an effect. That's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, social responsibility is a big part of how we operate. And so, you know, come and go, uh, we have a parent organization called the Crouch Group and Crouch Group has set out four pillars of social responsibility and each of the operating companies has a strategy against each of our pillars in order to just really kind of maximize and synergize the effects of these different operating companies. And so our pillars are purpose, people, planet, and philanthropy. And then underneath that, we've got focus areas. So uh, for example, in philanthropy, we've got three focus areas. In people, we've got three focus areas. In planet, we've got four focus areas. And so then that creates their own bodies of work inside of that. And so, um, you know, for example, we have, um, you know, let's take the planet pillar. And so um, carbon, uh, energy, water, and, uh, I'm blanking, sorry. Anyways, these pillars, we got a plan in place. And so um, on like our uh, water pillar, right? Like uh, this is especially important in Colorado where we have about 70 stores and it's our most profitable state. Um, there's a, just a, a lack of water resources in the state. And so if we can do what we can to operate our stores with less water, then that's our way to just take fewer resources from the planet. Um, waste is the fourth one. If anybody was going to you know, put me on blast for forgetting my own pillars, that's the one I forgot. Um, and so, yeah, we, uh, we operate with, with just a sense of doing the right thing. And, um, you know, we, like I said, I, I'm driven to the scale of this business because of the impact that we can have not only in our communities, um, but also in uh, our planet, also, you know, philanthropically. And so uh, it's a big part of what we do. It's a big part of who we are. And ultimately, you know, people do stick around for those reasons. Um, it's just challenging because a lot of the reasons why we're a compelling retailer take a little longer to explain, right? Like, you know, somebody might go in across the street and put a $16 an hour sticker in their window. And that's a very quick, direct and effective message to attract talent. Um, now our sticker might say, you know, 1350, but it's a guaranteed 1350 and it's a guaranteed 40 hours a week and it's 52 weeks a year. You know, they might start you at $16, but hey, in four weeks, they may drop you down to 28 hours a week or the manager could change and just not like you anymore. And then you could just be basically out of a job. And so we don't do that to people, but you know, there's a lot of short term needs in the frontline uh, labor economy. And, you know, some people need to make those decisions to get that income today because they've got bills today. So respect it. It just takes a little bit longer and harder to tell what we have to do, but the way that we approach our business. Um, let's see. I can't read probably all of these. Let me try to get some of this going on. Um, yeah. So COVID question, um, staff benefit. Yeah. So this question from Joseph again, yeah, you've got the positions pretty dialed in. Um, you know, the only thing I would say that maybe isn't mentioned there, is we've got restaurants in 75% of our stores, right? So Come and Go has a proprietary food program. And so we've got a food manager, food associates, you know, we're, uh, we're uh, pizza is our biggest category of food sales, breakfast sandwiches, lunch sandwiches, cold sandwiches. Um, it's more than just the, you know, gas station, roller grill, hot dog thing that you saw in the Simpsons growing up. It's, it's uh, you know, fresh food made, made in store, things like that. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about our strategy. Um, but there is a big part about that. Uh, we, so in the benefits question, I mean, our, our, you know, like 75% of the people in our stores are full-time. And, uh, if you work in our store full-time, then you have access to our benefits package. And the, so if you're like just a, a frontline sales associate in a come and go store, you have the exact same benefits package that I have as the CEO of the company. The only exception is I get more PTO, but, but like everything else is the same you know so they get five days of pto i get 25 days of pto pto is next to wages the most expensive benefit that we can offer people because you're paying you know somebody that hourly wage to work like it's easy to win on pto if you're a 
white collar employer because there's not really a hard cost of people taking time off. When you've got you know more blue collar jobs, there's a literal hard cost to every shift you have to cover due to PTO. So it's just expensive to expand that benefit, but it's super important to people and we want people to have that work-life balance. So we aren't able to really lead in that space, but we certainly try to stay competitive in that space. Um, you know, uh, these are good questions. I, I, um, I'm trying to see the background of our business. Um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit now about, so I see a question from uh, Shruti and uh, that'll be an entryway into a bit of our family story. So I like to say that Come and Go was founded uh, on love. Uh, where we had, um, you know, a young strapping William Krauss in 1959 working for Continental Oil Company. And uh, he was engaged to be married to uh, a beautiful Nancy Gentle. And uh, Continental Oil Company wanted uh, Bill Krauss to open the territory of Wyoming and go out and do his sales work in uh, the wild, wild west. And um, Nancy's father, um, Tony Gentle or Antonio Gentile, uh, he said, there's no way in hell you're bringing my only child to Wyoming. Um, nice try, uh, let alone my daughter. So how about I make you a counter offer? And uh, how about I buy that store that's for sale in downtown Hampton and you run that store for me? And uh, oh, by the way, I'm gonna pay you less than Continental offered you, but uh, you're gonna stick right here. And so my great grandfather, you know, kind of bought the business and led the business. My grandfather ran that first store. And there were 11 gas stations in Hampton, Iowa in 1959 when they started that first store, 11. This is a town of 5,000 people. Um, there's only one today of those 11 that has survived. And oh, by the way, we now do about two and a half billion in revenue. And so, uh, so much credit goes to my grandpa and my great grandpa for uh, what they were able to accomplish. They were a great partnership and team. My great grandpa passed when I was 18 years old, so I had a ton of time on earth with him. My grandpa, as aforementioned, passed in 2013, too soon, unfortunately, due to cancer. Um, but you know, those two really built an empire. And then my dad came in and he took over as CEO in 2004. And he, uh, he was able to really uh, maximize our assets and um, just take it to new heights in terms of profitability and scale and everything that we're doing. We're, from store count perspective, we're actually smaller today than we were when my dad took over in 2004. We had 440, then we have 410 today. Um, but our EBITDA is 6X what it was in uh, that time. And we've really just been able to uh, recreate our business inside and out. We had grown largely through acquisition through the 80s and 90s. My grandpa just loved to do deals and we had super quick ROIs. We just had, we were good at retail and we could just take over uh, a bankrupt store chain or something and we could put come and go on the sign, we could put come and go people inside and we could get a two year payback on an acquisition. And so we would just grow, 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 grow. And then my dad switched our strategy to be an organic growth strategy in which we were going to build our own stores and own the entire process and thus own the associate experience and the customer experience by designing a store that fits our brand and fits our brand strategy. And then it was in about 2010 when we decided to do our own food program and take on that part of our business. Uh, you know, we had done some partnerships with Subway and, you know, chains like that to, to attract people, you know, uh, with a food offering and, um, you know, long-term for us to, you know, really kind of grow and survive. We wanted to own the, the profit that came with that that sandwich and and really develop our brand into more of a food brand itself and not rely on other brands to to drive the the, the business or sorry to drive that that trip so uh, we started building even bigger stores in 2010 2011 and uh now we're building you know obviously i'm biased but i think the most beautiful come and go store or the beautiful most beautiful gas station c store in in the, in the country uh, if you haven't seen our stores check us out uh, they're quite nice and uh, we've really kind of changed the brand perception of come and go from having kind of old dinky assets to really, you know, being the, the brightest, biggest, cleanest, safest stores in the industry. And, um, you know, as dad started to think about kind of his um, second stage, his second career, he started to uh, look to diversify what we have outside of come and go. 
um, and, and just, you know, didn't want to have too many of our eggs in, you know, the one basket. And so starting in 2015, he really led a diversification strategy and used these, uh, you know, increased cash flows from come and go to uh, expand our enterprise. And um, my dad <clears throat> has a big passion for Italy. Uh, you know, that was his mother, Nancy Gentle. And so you go back that bloodline, we're Sicilian. And um, we were just, he just, he, my dad loves the finer things. He loves the, the Italian life, the Italian lifestyle, Italian clothes, Italian wine, Italian food. And so sure enough, we uh, have quite the interest in Italy. Um, in 2015, we bought a winery in Piedmont. Um, so we make Brollo, Barbaresco, Altalanga, Barbera, Roero, all the traditional varietals of that region. Uh, serendipitously, we made the acquisition between my two years of the DePaul program. And so um, I actually, for my summer quote unquote internship, I uh, was the interim president of an Italian winery. Um, don't ask your career services department to get you that same placement. It's not likely to be successful, but please call me if you're qualified. And so I moved to Italy and I was able to uh, lead the transition from previous ownership into our family style of ownership and through that first harvest and eventually find my replacement in my backfill and then move back to the Chicago and, and, and to graduate. While I was there, I made relationships. One of those relationships became um, our second acquisition. And so uh, a more familiar Piedmontese winery is Vietti. And so in 2016, we completed the acquisition of Vietti, which was a uh, five generation Italian family winery in one of the crown jewels of the Barolo region. And so we have two wineries and that really led a lot further expansion of investment in that territory. Um, if you've ever been to uh, the Barola region or the Longa, as some people call it, um, it's a really incredible part of the world. Uh, it's an underrepresented uh, travel destination inside of Italy, uh, but I know Raphael can advocate for the beauty and the uh, food and wine experience in that region. My dad's very bullish on it, and so we acquired more land. Uh, we acquired a bed and breakfast, and in about like three weeks, we're going to open a five-star resort in the hills of Piedmont called Casa di Longa. And we'll have a 38 room uh, boutique hotel with an emphasis on uh, the land and the food scene. And there'll be on-site garden, on-site vineyards, um, high-end chefs, and, and of course the proximity to our wineries, but also the entire region of goodness. That is uh, the Longue, Alba, um, Barolo, Roero region. It's just a wonderful part of the world. Um, so that accelerated things. Also started buying land in Des Moines. So, you know, we've got a uh, uh, 10 different businesses at this point, um, two wineries. Uh, we've got the, a real estate company that develops land in Piedmont and in Des Moines. Uh, we have a fuel transportation company. We have a organic sheep farm uh, with 300 sheep. Actually, it's just lambing season. So now we're about 600 or 700. That's my stepmom's passion project. She's the only organic lamb farmer in the state of Iowa. It's fantastic. I'm now super spoiled on my lamb game. Uh, we have a soccer team, an amateur soccer team in Des Moines. We have ambitions to bring professional soccer to Des Moines, a project called Pro Iowa. We're trying to do a public-private partnership to raise money to build a soccer-specific stadium in downtown Des Moines. So if you know the Polk County Supervisors Board, please call them and tell them you're supportive of the Pro Iowa movement and they should fund us to the full extent of our request. Thank you, please. Um, we also um, have an Italian soccer team at the uh, highest level. So in August of this past year, we acquired Parma Calcio uh, and the Serie A soccer franchise in, in Italy. And uh, that really uh, accelerated my transition to beginning the CEO because we was our biggest acquisition ever and uh, just given the state of the club and what we have the talent over there, my dad really ended up um, really kind of being the CEO of Parma for a year. We've just now hired uh, kind of co-CEOs to, to take over and lead the project. Um, but really, it's been uh, quite the journey. So we have a lot going on in our world. We arguably too much going on. Um, but really, between the preparation that I got for this my whole life, working in stores, working in the business, Loyola and DePaul uh, combined with my dad's, you know, just increased 
activity outside of come and go allowed me to transition into my dream job January 1st. And so I'm four months into being the CEO. And, um, you know, it was a gradual transition of sorts uh, because, you know, I've been the president since, you know, June of 2018. Uh, so 18 months or more. And my dad has continued to, to allow me more responsibility and influence inside the business. Uh, but I will say it's nice to have him outside of the room um, and just to be able to kind of set my own pace, set my own path, set my own vision, and not to like look over my shoulder or, or seek constant approval and have any kind of confusion in the business. Well, is Tanner saying this or is Kyle saying this? And so um, we do, at Come and Go, we've done this for about 25 years. We've done a, an, kind of an annual strategic planning session where the senior team does an offsite three or four days and we just think, you know, long term about the business and just make sure that we're, you know, headed down the right path. So I was able to lead that this year independently, which was nice for the first time. A lot of our Q1 is going into the prep for that. And then kind of in April, we typically hit the, the week long session. And really um, what I wanted to focus on, you know, we, we had our strategies in place and we're not really changing our strategies, but we're just getting a little more aggressive in places because, uh, you know, I view the biggest threat to come and go as the erosion of gasoline demand. And when you think about just the evolution of the automobile, you know, it's not going in our favor. And so um, going into this, you know, our updated financial forecast, our 10 year plan, uh, we were not really making progress towards uh, lessening our dependency on fuel. And I found that to be unsatisfactory. I, I thought we had to, you know, start to make this uh, a bigger priority and make sure that we were um, not being too casual with the state of our business relative to our fuel dependency. So um, we, we set a new target. We said we kind of have our, our proverbial BHAG and, and we said, okay, by 2035, we're going to be off of fuel dependency. And so if we still have fuel margin in 2035, which we will, that's going to be gravy, but we're going to be profitable without it. You know, today our business is very dependent on fuel. Uh, we're actually one of the most fuel dependent companies in the entire industry. Um, there's on most of that, honestly, it's how we finance our business is the reason for that. Um, we do a really aggressive amount of uh, sale leaseback on our new stores. Um, and so we have a program where we'll, you know, we, we build a store and it's about $7 million per store. And it's about $5 million, uh, it's about $2 million for land usually and about $5 million for everything else. And so uh, we keep the equipment, which is about $2 million, and then the $5 million of land and building uh, and improvements that we've made, we then go sell to a third party and basically sign a 20-year lease with four or five-year options. Uh, so it basically serves as, uh, remember where cap rates are, about a 6% annuity for an outside investor, it's kind of a corporate bond, if you will. They're banking on come and go to be able to you know, be solvent for the period of the lease. And then we get 6% money and our new store uh, returns are better than 6%. And so we're able to uh, just grow quicker and deploy capital quicker because we're getting in a post-sale lease back, we're getting returns, uh, healthy double digits. And so we can just spin the machine faster by doing this. Well, that, that does to our p l though, is it, it, we have a huge rent burden. And so we've got these long-term liabilities in the form of our rent line that we have to cover. And if you think about having to cover your long-term liabilities and, and your expense side, um, you know, and we're trying to get to our business to a place where we aren't going to use fuel margin to be able to pay our bills anymore, that just increases the pressure, the pressure on the rest of the store to do its work to pay bills but also it increases the pressure on anyone that has any sort of control over a cost line to slow down the acceleration. I've already said, we've had plans to grow our biggest cost line compensation uh, well above market for the foreseeable future. Uh, well, that means that everything else in the cost line really has to slow down. And so we have to be um, much more aggressive at how we deploy capital in order to, um, spend money now to take money out of business on an ongoing basis. And so uh, we're, we've got this new kind of direction. And what we found is that we're going to have to uh, lead a bit of a cultural change to 
how we think because we've been trained to think more methodical, more incremental. And that we, what we've seen is that type of uh, growth won't get us to our goals of uh, fuel independence in time. And so we're going to have to build a culture of thinking that is a little more innovative, a little more uh, what could be, a little more test and learn. And we're going to need stronger processes in place to be able to measure tests and see what that can do for our business. Um, so it's been a bit of a change. I'll just pause with talking a lot and I see a couple of hands raised. Um, so Aaron, I know you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, uh, so in talking about, cause you're, um, adjusting your strategy away from fuel as the main, uh, like, uh, helping your margins out. Um, do you see that, uh, as in like, you're moving away from, um, car fueling in general, or is it like incorporating new electronic technologies, uh, with, I mean, obviously, as I say that, it's not like we all have a crystal ball into like what those technologies are like hardcore yet, but like, is that a part of your plan? And are you feeling like you're enabling some of that technology by having this on your roadmap? Yeah, good question. So we 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 think uh, the electric engine is going to be the, the dominant engine. There was a time in there when you thought it might be, you know, uh, LNG or CNG or, um, hydrogen fuel or something else, but it looks like uh, lithium powered ion batteries are going to be the dominant you know, infrastructure for automobiles going forward. That could change, but there's a lot of momentum in that direction right now. So it looks like it's gonna win. The problem is um, how people keep their cars energized is gonna just completely change. And we won't be able to uh, monetize charging nearly to the extent that we can monetize fuel because uh, most of the people that are DePaul alums will have a charger in their garage and you'll just go home and plug your car out you plug your phone in. Um, now the ungaraged population will need a place to charge, um, but they'll likely will find charger infrastructure at their place of work or the grocery store or their bank or destinations that are already going to be 15 or more minutes. You know, we're a two minute trip now with our food, we might be a 10 minute trip, but um, it's going to be challenging for us to maintain our share in charging. And so we're advantageous and we'll, we'll, we'll jump at any subsidy. We've got 15 stores active with, with chargers. Um, we're waiting on governments to deploy some of that Volkswagen settlement money to, to EV infrastructure, which we will, we've got relationships with the state of Missouri, state of Colorado. And so we'll take that public money and, and we'll, we'll do the, the retrofitting and we'll do some of the, the new store build outs on the EV side, but long-term it's not gonna be for us. Um, and you know, so the, the pace of EV adoption is one thing, but the bigger threat to our fuel demand over the next 10 years is just the natural improvements and efficiency of the internal combustion engine. You, know, you look at cafe standards, which were locked in at 24 MPGs requirements for about 30 years. And now they've gone from 24, and they're going to 44 in a period of about eight years. And so the federal government's requiring a much more efficient engine. And, you know, you just think about, let's say you drive a 20 MPG car today, you go out and get a new car tomorrow, it's going to be a 40 MPG car. Okay, so that customer's fuel demand just went in half overnight. And that does nothing to do with an EV at all. And so, you know, this threat is not all dependent on EV or government subsidy of EV or any of that, it's just naturally going away. And so we've got to be prepared for that. Um, cool, thank you. Yeah, of course, Professor Thompson, you got your hand up. Sure. So, you know, you were talking about the what could be, um, you know, kind of in your senior meetings. And I'm just curious, like, how should we be thinking about the future of convenience stores and the future, like, you know, in terms of the, 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 the format of the store and just how we think about the business as a whole, like where we're going. I, you know, you're, you're talking about the deviation away from fuel. Got some uh, some cats that are working their way around. But um, you know, like, how should we be thinking about that? You know, like the world going forward. As yeah. Really so, yeah, that's great segue for me. Thank you. Well timed. Um, because really, like, you know, come to our business simplistically. Like, so one third of our margin comes from fuel, and two thirds comes from retail, and um, you know, both of those, both of our business models, if you want to separate it that simplistically are under attack. And so like we talked about fuel, right? Like just efficiency, economies, EVs, 
Okay, and then now to Brian's question, now what's the convenience side of what we do and how's that look? Well, we're brick and mortar retail and look at what digital commerce has done to brick and mortar retail for the last 25 years. I mean, it's decimated it, right? Like just look at all, like Macy's is closed on Michigan Avenue, right? Like just bankrupt. I mean, you look at Borders, bankrupt, Blockbuster, Bend, Oregon, one store, like just, it's not been a good century for brick and mortar retail. Now, our version of brick and mortar retail has been the hardest to disrupt because we're, what I like to say is we're not in the convenience business, we're in the immediate consumption business. You know, like our value is when somebody is wanting something right away, right? Like we sell fairly ubiquitous consumer packaged goods, um, but you come to the convenience industry because you're crunched on time. And you, you know, like grocery is gonna have a better assortment and better pricing. Discount and uh, club is gonna have a better assortment and better pricing. So if those were your priorities, you would go to Jewel Osco and get your 20 ounce diet coke. But you don't wanna park in that parking lot. You don't wanna walk to that big store waiting those big lines. So you go to a C store and you're in that 90 seconds, right? And so what's happening now though, is some of the best funded companies in the entire world are trying to crack the last mile. And so you see what Amazon is doing by buying Whole Foods and you know they've got those prime trucks just swirling in my neighborhood nonstop, right? Like um, they're getting the infrastructure out there to have a pretty broad distribution network. You look at Uber and you know they had some uh, financials got released and they talked about the importance of their Eats program relative to their rideshare program and what's happened as the pandemic has changed their business. And you look at uh, the money behind uh, GoPuff, which was started in a dorm room by MBA students. So kids, you can do this too, just go for it. But that company is now valued in the billions, right? You look at Drizzly just sold the Uber for one and a half billion. The guy my age started it in Notre Dame. Like these companies now have huge bucks and they're trying to solve for that last mile delivery or that immediate consumption uh, use case. And you know, the, the thing is, is, is their business model is not complicated. Like they've got an app, you scroll, you find your product, you push send, and then somebody just drives it to your door, right? Like there's outside of like a little bit of a UX in your app and a little bit of ML in your search algorithm, there's not a ton of sauce in what they're doing. It's pretty simple retail. It's just a matter of capitalization and you have these companies that are just losing money on every single transaction, but it's a share game to them. And they just want to be able to survive. And eventually this will become a duopoly, like a lot of big industry in America. And if you're one of the last man standing, you're probably going to find a way to monetize that share and those customers. And that's what the VCs are betting on. And so, you know, coming has got a bunch of things to fight, right? Like we're fighting battles all across the business. And now all of a sudden we've got to fight battles for share in the convenient portion of the retail landscape against Amazon and Uber. And they're better capitalized than come and go, right? Like we're a pretty successful family business. They are the biggest tech companies in the entire world, right? So um, it's a challenge in terms of, you know, how hard do we go? How, how much do we, how much of our, money and our profit do we push towards retention what's the advantage of being early in this space versus coming in late in this space how hard will it be to reacquire customers and so these are questions that we're asking i don't have the answers necessarily but i know that we've got to figure this out because ultimately if there's a more convenient way to buy what we sell we will lose our value proposition and thus lose the customer and so we've got to make sure that we've got a uh, like I said, we just have to make sure that we're the most convenient place to shop what we sell. And so how I think we can win, right? So strategy, well, let's look at our advantages. Let's look at our, our strengths. Let's look at our assets. How do we leverage those? You know, one differentiator between us and all those companies I mentioned is that we have 400 brick and mortar locations, right? Like, so there's like one Amazon distribution center in the Des Moines area. Uh, right. Like there's uh, like one warehouse that does GoPuff. 
you know, there's like 10 grocery stores or maybe like 20 for like the biggest chain in the Des Moines area. So we've got 50 stores in Des Moines. So we have 50 distribution centers. And so if we're really talking convenience and if people are really going to continue to value time, then we can leverage our stores to give us a speed advantage in the delivery economy. Uh, it's, you know, technology is a great equalizer. And, you know, uh, come and go is 5,000 square feet. Costco is 250,000 square feet. Uh, but in your apps, they're all the same size. And so we've now lost the inherent advantage of having smaller stores that are easier to shop. Our, you know, there's no parking lot when you're buying it on phone. So the fact that our parking lots are easier to get in and out of is no longer an advantage of ours. And so we've now lost a lot of our inherent advantages towards being more convenient. However, we think we can win by integrating a strong digital customer experience with our number of distribution centers. And so our store design is evolving to be smaller and we want to look at we're starting to we used to look at uh like half mile one mile population around stores as one of the most important inputs to our model now we're looking at two and a half minute population two and a half minute drive time population and we want to know like how quickly could we get a delivery out to somebody in this circle and so uh you know we're we're pushing more towards urban core we're pushing more towards density um and we're we're looking for areas where we can continue to provide uh, what we do and get it to people quickly and so uh our our you know we have kind of a big three when it comes to like our, our strategies kind of the way that we phrase it people food and digital and we want those three to be differentiators for the come and go brand and you know in that you know i think long term will continue to evolve and we'll be more of a restaurant, fast casual kind of QSR type of restaurant. And then we'll have a pretty healthy alcohol business. And I think those two categories will be our dominant forces going forward because people are always gonna wanna drink and they're always gonna need to eat. And so I think if we can have a really compelling alcohol offering and a really compelling food offering, and we can put a lot of stores around a lot of people, then that allows us to better block out and win against Amazons and Ubers who, you know, I know they have a lot of money, but it'll take them a long time for them to get 60 dark stores or 60 brick and mortar stores in Des Moines area. There's just a lot of catching up to do. And so we think that we can leverage that asset for us as our major competitive advantage in an integrated mixed economy of both uh, digital and delivery. I'd give it an A, Tanner. Man, <laughs> why couldn't you give me an A four years ago, man? <laughs> oh man um thank you for your question um i haven't been paying attention here um molly question how do you define your competition um i have a good answer for this so i'll take your question um i say our competition is anyone that sells diet coke um if you sell diet coke you're a competitor and so um you know it's like I said, eventually the technology with delivery, everything will be equalized and it'll just be, it'll be shopping right here on your phone. Um, by the way, sorry for my lighting. My lighting is really poor. I would like the sun coming into my little closet here in my home office. So I apologize. You don't want to see me anyways, but um, anyone that sells Diet Coke, that's our competition. Raphael, I see you got your hand up. Um, and yes, I have a related question. Obviously there's a lot of things that are changing and you're, you are ahead of the curve and, you know, thinking about these things. But could you just tell us, uh, kind of like in broad, broad strokes, how, how is it that at a high level, how do you approach expansion and, and growth? What are the types of conversations that you have when you're talking about growth and expansion? Yeah, so we, we view capital allocation into our business with two buckets, improving and scaling. And we have to strike the right balance of when to improve more and when to scale more. And we never go all in on one side. We try to keep a balance. And so improving would be um, enhancing our app functionality and expanding would be building a new store. And so uh, we try to strike that balance because 
you know, scale helps. I mean, once you've got a really improved business model, you know, leveraging that across 700 locations does better for you than 400 locations. And so you have to kind of, you know, play both of these races simultaneously. So when we look at our growth strategy, uh, you know, we want to have a strong market presence. And so we look at the competitive landscape, we look at the strength of brands, we look at the um, number of community stores per thousand people in the market and see what the, uh, how saturated it is for our industry. And we weight that based upon the strength of the competitors that, are, that actually have those stores. Um, and ultimately we wanna make sure that we've got you know, enough people to support enough volume per store and enough stores per market so that we can establish a brand and just achieve some economies of scale when it comes to not only building a customer brand, but also an employment brand. And so we've got uh, a model. We, uh, we buy some software that gives us some projections and then we have an intro model and we kind of merge the two and that's the, the performance or the projections that we use for our performance. And so uh, significant inputs to the model include traffic counts on the two cross sections, the two roads, uh, includes population density, both like kind of um, actual where people live, but also daytime population, daytime population density where people uh, work and where they're at driving around for their, their, their day jobs. Um, like I said, drive time, uh, look at competition, and then the presence of not only C stores and gas, but also the presence of QSRs, the presence of other retail. Um, I don't know. So we will, uh, you know, we got a real estate team. We're, we're building, you know, we'll open 18 stores this year, um, which we'll, we'll miss plan by two, I think. Um, the goal next year, again, is 20. And then we're going to, you know, uh, expand 25 stores, 25 stores, 30 stores, 30 stores, and continue to grow. Uh, so we're adding people to our real estate team. Uh, we're going to expand into new new markets. We'll announce that. I can't give you guys the, the lead, but we'll announce that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'll be entering um, multiple new markets. And so uh, we'll just continue to grow and expand. Uh, but we can't lose sight of our backyard. And so we invest in all of our existing markets. So uh, even our, our slow growth markets, we commit to building one store every three years just to make sure that we're protecting our turf and, and our share and uh, providing new opportunities and continuing to bring the latest and greatest of our brand experience to customers and associates. So, um, yeah, it's uh, a little bit of what we do. Hopefully that was answered your question. Happy to go deeper if you want to go deeper, but yeah. Um, a bunch of new stuff. I'm sorry. Um, got you now. Some comments, good comments. Um, yeah, I'm kind of like officially into the Q&A portion, I guess. Um, uh, let me see, Joseph put a question in here. Let's see. Yeah, so we'll talk about robots and things uh, from Joseph's question. So, I mean, we, um, uh, we've got wage rates growing at, you know, something like 7% for the next five or six years. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're going to let our comp line grow at 7% for the next five or six years. You know, we're going to look at what we can to reduce uh, frequency of tasks, reduce complexity of tasks, or to centralize and remove tasks altogether. And so one example of something that we've done that has nothing to do with robots, uh, but we were, we were doing three shift cuts a day, kind of end of each eight hour shift, we do a shift cut. And that's when you count the drawer and cash and whatever. And so we, um, we tested what, what does two shift cuts do to us? And, um, through that, we, we didn't see any negative impacts to cash control or really kind of anything else negative in the business. And so we reduced the number of shift cuts from three to two. That took like 20 minutes a day out of our stores, uh, which equates to a half million dollars a year in labor savings right there. Um, so, you know, ideas like that, you know, we used to mop our floors. Now we have like a Zamboni machine that we push down the aisles to, you know, do the mopping for us. You know, like, okay, so we spent uh, six grand per store uh, to, to add this technology. And we used to give, you know, 30 minutes a day to mop. Now we give 18 minutes. And so that project had a ROI of, I don't know, three years. And so uh, we'll look for automation. We'll look for frequency and complexity reductions. We have a continuous improvement team that leads that charge for us. And with our uh, increases wage rates, it just makes the ROI of a lot of capital outlay in that space a lot more attractive. So we'll do more of that coming forward for sure. Senor Dabucci, I see your hand. I'm 
just I'm just hoping my dog doesn't start barking here while I ask this. I'm actually going to pivot this a little bit uh, back to what you're doing in Italy, if you don't mind. Um, and so it's it seems to me that what that that your acquisitions there are sort of one way to hedge also against. Uh, declines in, in retail and, and fuel in the United States. But uh, as a company, you seem to be a company that is very concerned about the culture and the way that you fit in and the culture that you develop for your workers. And I'm, I'm going to hedge a guess here that when you went to Italy and bought the Lieti winery, um, that there was some pushback from the locals. Uh, being an Italian, and I see my friend Raffaele Colucci is also here, I, I'm, I'm going to assume he may agree with me, that it, Italians may not necessarily welcome uh, something like that. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you navigate the culture? How do you navigate uh, dealing with sort of cultural pushback and making yourself part of a, a very, very different kind of community? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... As I just pay attention, I just see myself, there. I'm like on the witness protection program. I'm gonna to try to turn my laptop and see if uh, this helps. Hey, now you guys can see me. I have a beard as you couldn't tell earlier. Um, anyways, that's a little better. So um, we, so your first part of your question, you're absolutely right. I mean, we're diversifying away from this, the risk of having all of our stuff in one enterprise to begin with. And that's a lot of what's driving the uh, Italian strategy is the diversification. And so um, then you talked about, you know, just how we go about, you know, integrating what we do and being accepting locally. And um, the good news is it hasn't been that hard for us. We've been accepted pretty well. And one of the reasons why is because uh, we show up and, and we're not uh, helicopter owners, we're not, um, you know, uh, we're not private equity trying to, you know, get a three-year payback or a four-year payback on big acquisitions where you just really squeeze and stress the, the assets and the people. You know, we, we're a family-owned business that thinks generationally. And so we want to establish a portfolio of companies that can uh, outlast, you know, any of us individually as Krauses and just become really, you know, heirlooms for the family. And so, you know, I say this a lot of times, you know, my job at Come and Go is to give the business to my daughter in a better place than the, how I found it. And, and you know, that's, that's, why, that's what my role is, my responsibility. And, and I'll tell her the same thing, you know, hopefully she wants to run the company one day and I'll tell her the exact same thing, like, this isn't your company. This is, this is not yours to, 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 to sell, this is not yours to, um, you know, use for your own personal gain. Like this is what we do as a family and it's your job to give it to your daughter. And so you know, that's how we approach things. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, just having a, a sense of social responsibility and, and how we show up uh, assist us. Um, but, you know, especially as you know, you know, being in Italy, you know, there's no substitute for um, a meal. There's no substitute for actually sharing a glass of wine with somebody. And that's why it was very important when we bought Enrico Serafino that a family member, myself, was there. And, you know, I, 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 I went in there with, you know, respect and humility for the culture and the tradition and what I needed to learn. And uh, people responded well to that. And, you know, when, when we bought Enrico Serafino, um, nobody really bristled at that. You know, like it made the news and oh, there's some Americans coming in and then spending some money around, you know, like, yeah, that, you know, there's some chatter. But, you know, honestly, the winery sold to the Campari group um, eight or 10 years prior to us buying it. So we bought it from Campari Grupo, the big spirits company. So this was already a, a winery that had changed out and gone to kind of big public company ownership. And, you know, it, it wasn't. It wasn't, uh, you know, historically, it's a very important wine. You go back, you know, we're found in 1878 and Serafino Enrico was, was one of the pioneers of the wine industry in the early 19th century, or so the early 20th century. Now you fast forward to buying Vietti and yeah, that turned a lot of heads, you know, cause it's like, okay, you know, no one really cared when you bought like, you know, that guy over there. Um, but, you know, now to come into the heart of Castiglione Saletto and, and to buy this crown jewel, okay, like, what are the Americans doing? And, you know, 
it takes time, you know, and, and you know, listen, we'll, we'll never be, uh, you know, uh, fully Italian, you know, we'll, we'll never be, you know, uh, multi-generation from that region. Um, but, you know, Luca and Elena are, are, are still running the business and um, it took time to earn that trust, you know, but ultimately, you know, we're not Americanizing anything, right? Like we're like our value add is to, you know, provide capital and to give more land and control over more of the grapes that we use in our wine. And uh, that makes Luca and the Vietti family happy. And that makes the drinkers of Vietti wines happy. And, you know, ultimately it's just been with a respect for what we do. And, you know, being from Iowans, you know, and, and coming from just more of a agrarian, you know, state, you know, there's just some parallels to Piedmont and even Emilia Romana and Iowa. You know, these are, these are really kind of, uh, bread baskets for the broader country. And you think about just, you know, cattle and, and pig and corn and bean here in Iowa, and you think about, you know, cattle and, you know, some corn, but also pig and, uh, you know, certainly grapes and, and Piedmont that is just, you know, they're providing a lot of that for the country. So there's just enough similarities there, but nothing beats showing up and, and nothing beats showing up repeatedly and, you know, doing so in, in the local custom, which, Oh, by the way, it's like over three plates of pasta and two bottles of wine. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show up for that. Um, you know, some of the reasons why we're tracking to Italy is, is just we, we have a passion for the culture and we have respect for the heritage. Yeah. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Andres, I see your hand is up. Yeah. First of all, Tyler, thank you. I think I made the first comment here that this is what fun looks like in, in, uh, in these times, but I really have enjoyed sitting here and listening to you in uh, on my Friday evening. Um, so I really appreciate the transparency and your willingness to to share what this all entails to lead uh, come and go. So, so thank you for that. Um, from Italy, I'm going to take us back to at least organizational culture. Um, and you, you spoke to the well, what, what I heard in what you shared is just a tremendous amount of care for the people that um, that operate the business. And in that, you've made some, some choices, some might say some bold choices to really increase um, uh, level of pay and, and the having a lot of people uh, be employed full time, which I'm imagining is, is different than what the industry does. How do you build that business case and convince the people on your team when it comes to these bold choices that don't have a very clear ROI or very proven ROI, how does that compare to the COI, the cost of inaction? And how do you have those conversations? Yeah, so the benefit of being privately owned, family owned especially, is that we don't have to perform for anybody but ourselves when it comes to financials. And so, so long as our family is satisfied with how things are going, that's all the shareholders that we have to please. We don't have external investors who are expecting a certain rate of return and a certain period of time. And so that allows us to, to me, that's one of our biggest competitive advantages as a company is that we are able to do things that other people have a tough time to justify. And you know, when we do some of these things for our people, um, it's very common to hear from other peers in business to say, you're doing the right thing. That's great for the business. That's great for the business. Um, but if it was really great for the business, you would see every retailer in America offering paid maternity leave, right? Like that doesn't ROI within the time frame of the typical external investor. And so we don't have that burden. And so it is great for the business, but really it's a really long-term great for the business and from a financial perspective, right? It's the investment today that'll build the culture that'll make this a place of work that is really attractive to people that those benefits pay out over a long period of time. And so when possible, we really try to make those type of investments so that we can be thinking very long-term and leverage that advantage, which is our ownership structure. Um, you know, internally selling it wasn't very difficult because you know, everybody wants to do the right thing for their people. And if you can take off the fact that we don't need to prove an ROI on something, then everybody's like, yeah, okay, then sign me up, right? 
And, you know, we, nobody's bonus got negatively impacted because of what we did, right? I mean, we're bonus people off targets and we put this into our plan and said, here's our target, go beat it. And we beat it. And so, you know, it wasn't like we were Ralph and Peter to pay Paul either. Uh, unless, you know, Peter in this case is our family, which um, don't worry about us, we're fine. Thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting though, like, I was on a panel yesterday around uh, mental health and well-being for the employee. And mental health is a topic that I've spoke out a lot on in the last you know, 12 months or so. And you know, a lot, I was the CEO voice and there were you know, experts and mental health care professionals and providers and those kinds of things on my panel with me and um, talked a lot about you know, that same question of how do you justify you know, what might be seen as a soft return or as um, you know, maybe it doesn't stack up next to some sort of you know automation in your in your plant or some other alternative investment. And the good news is that there's a there's a really strong and growing amount of research out there that shows uh, more translatable kind of hardline benefits to solving for things like mental health. And an example that I got on the uh, panel yesterday is this woman. It's like the director for the National Council of Mental Health Affairs or something like that. And she was like, you know, if, if uh, mental health is untreated in your employee population, those employees are more than two times likely to have a medical absence within 12 months. Well, absenteeism is a very trackable statistic with a very real cost attached to it. And so the more that you can connect the dots between um, something that may seem soft or tough to measure and follow its way through to things that are on your P&L, the easier this gets. And so I've seen more of that research um, evolving. And, you know, at that point you can say, listen, you know, let's do this, you know, in this instance, a mental health investment. And, you know, let's see if absenteeism goes down. Give me a chance, you know, give me 12 months of, the, of this project. And if you can tie it to, you know, uh, reduced absenteeism, and or just increase productivity per hour work, then all of a sudden you're starting to get to, to get to uh, be able to prove out some um, P&L results for something that um, really should be driven just by an intrinsic desire to do right by people, right? Like you're just, you're, you're treating an illness or you're, you're, you're caring for your associates well being. you know, like in a perfect world, that's enough to get funding. Um, but, you know, in a capitalist society, not always. And so um, what I said in the panel is that, you know, hopefully at least you can pencil out some version of a return. Now, it may not be your top return project. It may not exceed necessarily your company's hurdle. But even if you get close, that's when I say, then go to the soft sell. Then say, listen, I know it's not double digit ROI, but it's close. And oh, by the way, this is really going to help people's lives. And I think that we're seeing more and more business leaders uh, lead with consciousness than at least what we've, you know, studied, you know, going back to the 80s and 90s and, and, and that style of leadership. Um, thank you. I, I appreciate that. My career after, I think we took uh, Professor Thompson's class together. Um, I went into coaching, so I, leadership development is, is what I do as well as organizational culture. So I'm very uh, intrigued by what you're sharing. I'm curious if I may ask a follow-up question, how all the changes that you've made, you, you've mentioned absenteeism. I can imagine that retention rate is something that has been positively impact. I'd be curious what you've noticed in terms of uh, customer experience and loyalty, if that is something that you track and, and notice, because that I would imagine has a direct impact on the bottom line that you could tie back to that organizational culture. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's let's see. Um, it's a great question. I don't know if I have a great answer. Um, you know, we, we track, you know, we have a loyalty program. So that gives us transaction level data for a lot of our transactions. Um, we also track uh, kind of generic customer survey scores, customer service response to their mystery shops. And, um, you know, we've, you know, it, it, in retail, it's really hard to tease out cause and effect. There's so many variables. Uh, there's actually a company called Market Dial out of Salt Lake City that's doing a pretty good job of trying to tease out cause and effect in a retail environment. Uh, we're using them on some, some, 
some pilot programs, a couple of just smart young people out there doing their thing. And um, it's always kind of hard to say like, well, was the, you know, um, the annual meeting, you know, accretive to customer loyalty? There's just a lot of different things you have to link together to get to causality and that type of analysis. So it's difficult. So, um, you know, we, we certainly understand and, and you, you kind of pair it with anecdote by saying, you know what, like, yeah, this person is, is loyal to this associate of ours. And, and that is right. Like we talked about in the opening, like that's our magic. So if you can have better customer service and then all of a sudden somebody becomes loyal to the person over the counter, you know, that's great. You know, one thing I say to our company is, you know, success in our industry is getting somebody to inconvenience themselves to go to a convenience store, right? Irrational behavior in our industry is rare, but when possible, that's how you create alpha. And so if we can get a, a, a connection, if we can get somebody loyal to the associate behind the counter or loyal to what our brand stands up for and says on social media, or what our CEO says when, you know, I have a, a platform to speak and engage with people, then, okay, I'm going to become a come and go customer. And now and I'm going to go out of my way and I'm going to take longer on my lunch hour to go to a come and go because I, I associate with them and I align with their values and what they do. And that's, a, that's a big part of how we're trying to win customers. This uh, was a great conversation, Tanner. I can't say thank you enough for, for myself and for, I hope, I think, I think I'm speaking for everyone here. So we can give them a quick digital round of applause for such a like really open, transparent conversation. Um, and I can tell you like, uh, I would be honored to have the opportunity to work with you at some point. Like you sound like a great leader and you have a great sense of what's going on with your business and just the long-term strategy here. So thank you so much. Well, that's very kind of you, Aaron. Thank you. You're very welcome. Raphael, any last closing yeah. words? Um, no, I just want to echo what you just said. Uh, it's a great conversation. We, we got uh, much more than we bargained for here today. Uh, the, the transparency has been amazing, uh, very, very candid in general, and um, you know, many, many takeaways for the crowd here. Uh, a lot to, uh, to chew on if, uh, and to drink about also. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. uh, thank, you, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, no, thank you for the opportunity and the platform. And, and sorry, I didn't get my lighting figured out till like the very end of this call, but uh, hopefully it wasn't too bad for y'all. Um, and have a great Friday night. Um, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers on the call out there. Um, if you want to contact me after this, you can text me on LinkedIn or you can just shoot me an email on tanner.kraus at comeandgo.com. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but uh, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to connect. love to uh, hire you all if you are interested in retail or what we do. Um, but I uh, just want to say it's been good to see some of your familiar faces again and to everybody new out there. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for sticking on and uh, just really appreciate the time.